the gospel they said men and brethren what shall we do Peter said repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins Acts 2 38 the problem is sin don't let them tell you nothing different it's sin and the way sin is removed is by obeying the gospel being baptized in water for the remission or the removal of your sin I'm in Isaiah 43 at the scripture that was read Isaiah 43. Good to hear that everything went well with the uh, ladies' day. Our prayers were heard concerning you all. And now the pressure is on. Uh, brother's been talking about a men's day. We need a men's day. We need a men's day. Okay. <laughs> Got to humble yourself, though. <laughs> you ain't got that pride. You can't tell me nothing. Hey, we got to tell you something in the men's day now. <laughs> Amen. I know some of the brothers were hearing that we serving pulled pork. There's leftovers after service, wasn't it? <laughs> That's what they had. Isaiah 43. I'm going to start at verse number one. Isaiah 43, starting with verse number one. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not. I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I, I will give men for you and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the far east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him, yes, I have made him. Ziz, one of my favorite prophets. I don't think he ranks this. I know you're not supposed to rank him, but I just love his, his writings. I mean, they're just so prophetic and poetic. And in this particular scripture, really from Isaiah 41 through 48, it's a, uh, as one author puts it, there's a contrast and a contest between Jehovah and the idols, letting them know that no idol or no other being that would consider his or herself God can stand with him or against him. But I want to go ahead and give you the title of this lesson. As we are in a new year, closing our January, our theme being trust in the Lord. The title of this lesson is trusting God in the trenches. Trusting God, Almighty, trusting God in the trenches. Oh boy. 2024 is not going to be a year where you just walk on through it peacefully. You're going to have to, and I'm going to have to face some challenges in this life. One of the, this picture here is one of 10 photos of life in the trenches uh, during World War I. Uh, there's a website, IWM.org.uk, they do research on wars. 
They said the image of a soldier in a muddy trench is what many people visualize when they think of the First World War. However, most soldiers would uh, spend an average of four days at a time in, in front line trench. The, their daily routine when in the front line varied according to where they were. In active sectors, this is what they re research showed, both sides would engage in aggressive trench raiding and the fire from artillery, machine guns, and snipers would be a constant threat. They also go on to say, by contrast, some sectors were quiet and relatively passive with a uh, live and let live mentality. A soldier's experience depended on this variety. So you had some, they were in the trenches, they were in the mud, dealing with constant gunfire, dealing with the enemy raiding the trench, dealing with snipers trying to knock their heads off. And then you had some, although they were in the trenches, it wasn't as violent, you know, but they were nevertheless in the trenches. And, and brothers and sisters, I want to let you know that there are times in life, and, and it could be in 2024, where you're going to be in the trenches. Well, you're going to have to get comfortable with warfare. You know, you're going to have to say, well, it is what it is. This is what I'm going to have to deal with. I don't think the soldiers had too much time to really feel sorry for themselves in the trenches because the enemy doesn't feel sorry for you. Satan doesn't feel sorry for me. The devil in his, in his army isn't saying, whoa, to Brandon, look at what he's going through. They're saying we almost got him defeated. We got him right where we want him. He's getting discouraged. He, he's about to give up on God. That's exactly what we want him. But I come this morning to encourage you and I to trust God in the trenches, in the hard times, in the fighting times that, you know, is going to uh, come a point where you're going to have to say, Satan, I'm not backing back this time. You know, especially for the football lovers, you know, this whole thought of the trenches started in war, but went to the football field. You know, where you have these big linemen in the trenches, any, any big linemen, believe it or not, I was a big kid, you know, growing up, you know, uh, they didn't know that I, I stopped eating a lot once I got into high school, not because we were poor, because athletics was so hard, I would vomit a lot, you know, so, you know, you run, um, uh, Eight two hundreds, like man, I, I choose not to eat. I eat afterwards, and so I was very skinny. But afterwards, I shot back up into the two hundreds. And the coach asked me one time. He said, "Brandon, uh, Little Lee, he said, uh, uh, you want to be a linebacker or you want to be in the trenches this time?" He said, "It's your choice. It's your last game." He said, "Put me in the trenches. Put put me down there. It's something about that." about being in the trenches, being on the line that sobers you up, that really brings out a different side of you and makes you better. Let's get an understanding on this text from the great prophet Isaiah. What I love about Isaiah also is that God speaks through Isaiah, the great prophet. And this is, this is literally over 2,500 years ago. And this messianic prophet who mostly prophesies about Jesus the Christ before he comes also prophesies to you and I before we were even born. It's like God has already spoken to our future. Mm. He's not surprised that he's already spoken to it. Uh, he is a foreteller, Isaiah is. You know, in ancient times, foretellers were very popular. You know, the, the witches and wizards and all these different type of individuals. You know, nowadays you read your horoscope, uh, tarot cards, crystal balls, psychic readers, Ouija boards, you know, snake in the eight ball, I'm gonna shake up the eight ball, what should I do, what should I do, how things gonna work out for me, y'all ever seen the eight ball? We got some old people, y'all may need a suit. They shake up the eight ball and they say, what should I do in this situation? And it'll tell you yes, no, whatever. I don't got to look into any of that. 
What's your sign? Capricorn or Leo? <laughs> I'm a Leo. Oh, you a leader. We look into, God has fixed it for us to look into his word and allow him to speak to the future and trust what his, trust what his word has said concerning the future. And so it is in Isaiah 43, as God is making a contrast between him and idols, and God wants mankind to know that you depend on him. There is none beside him. So he says, but now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob. You know, Jacob, Israel, he who formed you, O Israel. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob talking to that Jewish nation, that Hebrew Israelite nation where it goes back to Abraham, but Abraham had a son, Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob wrestled with God. God changed his name to Israel. So when he says, oh, Jacob, oh, Israel, he's speaking about that whole nation. But yet it has a spiritual thought in it in connection with the church who is identified in Galatians 6, 16 as spiritual Israel. So this Israel and this spiritual Israel, God speaks to his people saying, fear not. Speaking to you today and into the future, stand on this word. Stand on this, fear not. This is the reason why a child of God does not have to fear. For I have redeemed you. I have bought you back. You are mine. You belong to me. So now God wants to give his people confidence based off the fact, this one fact, you are mine. And he has already been saying through Isaiah, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. There's none beside me. So he tells his people, you are mine. Who do you belong to? The Lord God, the living God. Jehovah, Yahweh, the everlasting God, the self-existing one. That's my confidence. I belong to God. So he says, based off that, fear not, I have redeemed you. Keep your finger there and come, to, come with me to 1 Peter chapter 1 in the verses 18. 1 Peter chapter 1 in the verse 18, the Lord says, I have redeemed you and you are mine. You belong to the Lord as a, a baptized believer who has been added to the Lord's church. In 1 Peter 1, 18, the Bible says, knowing that you were not redeemed, bought back with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. So these people, these Christians have been purchased. But what, but with what in verse 19, but with the precious blood, you wasn't bought with money. You was bought with something that is of great value. That's beyond calculation, beyond what any money can do. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Encouraging these Christians as they are dealing with suffering. They're being persecuted. And in the middle of them being persecuted, God reminds them, I have redeemed you. I bought you. And what I purchased you with cost me a lot. With the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb. He was the lamb of God, sacrificed by the father himself. Put on the altar and sacrificed by God almighty. But don't misunderstand, this was set forth before the foundation of the world. You know, so God speaks into time and then he organized some things before time even began. You know, God wasn't surprised at what took place in the garden. And God is not shocked at things that take place with you and I. So he gave his son so that we may be redeemed. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Acts 20, 28, as Paul is departing from these elders in Ephesus, in Ephesus in Acts 20, 28, therefore take heed to yourself 
and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Notice what he says about these Christians. To shepherd the church of God, acknowledging the deity of Christ, making it still the church of Christ, to shepherd the church of Christ, which he, who is the he? Christ, which he purchased with his own blood. So the father gave his son to redeem us, and the son bought us with his own blood. He, he died on the cross, rose from the dead, and used his blood as money. Use his blood to purchase those who would obey the gospel. And that's why he would say in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Matthew 16, in the verse 18, I also say to you, this church of Christ verse, Matthew 16, 18, I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, Peter had just made that great confession that thou the Christ, the Son of the living God, in verse 16. And, and Jesus says, well, you are Peter, and on this rock, what is the rock? And he didn't say Peter is the rock. You know, he didn't say on you. He said on this, on that confession that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. He said on this rock, this solid foundation. Why is it solid? Because it has Christ in it. And Christ, he is the rock. So on that confession that Jesus Christ is the son of God, I will build my that's what that's what changes the text. That's what set the whole text apart. I will build my possessive pronoun showing ownership. I will build my ecclesia. I will build my church. Jesus said, I'm building my own. So that when the when you have the Baptist Church established by John Smythe and the Methodist Church established by John Wesley, the Catholic Church the, uh, established by a group of men that left the Lord's Church, those are those are man-made religious groups. So we're talking about a church that exclusively belongs to the law where he is the founder. And we were not started by Alexander Campbell. There may be a few Campbellites, but I ain't one of them. <laughs> I ain't one of them. The Lord said, I will build my church and this church belongs to him. And he said, in the gates of Hades. The realm of the dead shall not prevail against it. Nothing can defeat it. Uh, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And no situation in life, let alone Hades, shall prevail against the Lord's people. So God wants us to be confident moving forward in 2024 and beyond. Knowing that you are a member of the Church of Christ. This blood ball institution that was purchased by the precious blood of Christ. And I have to walk in confidence saying I'm a child of God. I'm a member of the church of Christ. You know, church of Christ folk need to hold their chest out again. You know, need to start saying, hey, we, we hold the truth. We are God's people. Come back with me to Isaiah 43. Oh, it says, I've redeemed you. I bought you. I called you by your name. You are mine. And so he says in Isaiah 43, 2, to these people that he says, you belong to me. Since you belong to me, he says, when you pass. Now that word for when is key, which can really be translated when and while. So when you pass through the waters and while you are passing through the waters, when you're in the trenches. See, your life ain't going to be smooth. You're going to have to get down and dirty sometime. Yeah, you're going to have to take the halo off or say you just knock it off. Sometimes God, he come take it off and say, that ain't you. Put on that war gear. Put on that armor. You got to go fight. Oh, I don't want this side of Christianity. No, you, you don't. You misunderstand Christianity. Or you, gotta, you have a misunderstanding of true biblical Christianity. There are wars. There are battles that you have to fight. There are things you have to face. It's a part of the journey. 
It's, it is what it is. It's just a part of the journey. And when you win this battle, it's going to make you better. It's going to make you stronger. Every time Israel won a battle, it spread their fame. <laughs> that Joshua just defeated this king. And he defeated this king. And remember the time there were five kings came out against Joshua. Five kings came to take his life. Who were they manipulated by? Of course, Satan is behind the scene. But is Joshua backing away from the fight? Is Joshua giving up on God? Is he saying, why does this have to happen to me? Why do these type of things happen in my life? That's what we often say. Uh-uh. Joshua said, no, I know God has already given me the victory. This is going to be amazing. Je look, Joshua can visualize this is going to be amazing when I defeat these five kings. Why would he defeat him? Because God was with him. And why are you going to face trials and win in 2024? Because God is with you. So God says, when you pass through the waters... In deep, troubling situations in life, this is what's going to set you apart from everybody else. I will be with you. Look, he, he's just letting you know you got some battles to fight. See, he's speaking to you 2024. He's, matter of fact, he's speaking to your whole Christian life on earth. He's already letting you know there are some battles that's ahead. There are some deep waters, some deep troubling situations that are ahead. But don't worry, I will be with you in this fight. And, and through when you pass through the rivers, situation in which it seems like this, this situation is going to take you out where the pressure is on. You ever dealt with a situation where the pressure is on? Well, it's, this is really hard right here. Well, you're going to really have to put forth some effort. You know, last situation, the water came up to your knees and it came up to your neck. But remember, you kept going. And then you deal with another situation. And it's so, it's so much pressure. And it seemed like as soon as you stop trying, it, the, the waves are going to just sweep you away. The river is just going to sweep you away. And, and many people have been taken downstream. But God says to his faithful child, when you pass through these situations, they shall not. They shall not overflow you. Who is the you? The person that's been purchased. God didn't purchase you to live a defeated life. He purchased you to live a victorious life. This is going to give him glory. But it's, look, it overflows a lot of people, but it won't overflow you. And sometimes you have people waiting to see it overflow you. They waiting for your defeat. They waiting to see you fall. Just stand there because they ain't seeing it. Mm -mm, keep on looking. You're not going to see what you want to see. Yeah, look, you standing there, you in the middle, of, you moving. It look like you ain't doing nothing but one step at a time. Just keep going one step at a time. We're going to win this battle. Yeah, this won't get to victory. Yeah, it's a hard situation. It's a strangling, it's a straining situation. It's a situation that's filled with pressure, but I won't lose this battle. You got to get down in the dirt. You got to reach down and say, no, I'm not losing this battle. Whatever it may be, you can't just give up. You can't just throw in the towel. I'm trusting in the Lord in 2024. Say so says, let's see. God says, just hold on. They shall not overflow you when you walk. Notice this. You thought the, the water rising up to your knees or to your neck was something. You thought the river was something. The Lord says, when you, when you walk through the fire, when life is so hot and heated, you never expected this. Bad news. Bad outcome. I'm trusting in the Lord. Just hold on. Things happen in life. But now you're dealing with the flame. In this type of pressure, you can feel it in your soul. You're bothered on the inside. This is when it's hard to come to church. This is when you shave your head like Job. You know, look, in real life, we would have thought Job lost his mind. 
I mean, think of the man shaved his head like he really going through it. And imagine, you know, you walk in, somebody got the clippers and they just, they, and they, you know what I'm saying? They cutting off their hair. You what, what's going on with you? I ain't giving up. I ain't giving up. That's what Joe really saying. But see, some folk may think you're crazy because you're in this fight. Now, I ain't going crazy. I just go, I got to go somewhere else mentally. See, the person I was the other day, you know, kind, easy going. See, this situation done changed me. You ever had a situation and it changed you? This is, I'm different now. And Joe, like, I'm different. This situation done changed me. I done, I done lost my kids. I done lost my wealth. I done lost my stuff, man. I'm shaving my head. I ain't who I was yesterday. I'm in the fire. I'm in, I'm in the flame. I'm jumping. I'm covered in balls. You want, you want me to be walking with a suit and tie on? You know, I just start back wearing this, this tie because I have been in the was in the trenches for so long. Worry about no time. I had to become somebody else. Got a five-hour surgery ahead. Got a six-hour surgery here, so, so I got to switch gears. Anybody need to switch gears? And you need to change your, your, your whole mindset about, about life and, and how you look at it. And, and God allows these things. So when you walk through this fire, when you go through this situation, oh, God, I, just take it away. No, no, I can't take this away. Can't take this away. When you walk through this fire, look, you shall not be burned nor shall the flame scorch you, but it, it's hurt God. But you're going to make it through it. You're going to make it through it. God is letting his people know you're going to have some kind of difficulty in 2024. And you don't run backwards. You run to God to find the strength you need to fight this battle. And you got to keep in mind that the Lord God is with you. He's not a God that abandoned his people. This is what I've learned about God. He liked to fight. You ain't learned that about God in the Bible? God, the God we serve, he don't shy away from the fight. You know, a lot of times we look, all those people, they try to push this idea out of us. you know, meditate and you're going to have peace and all good things going to happen and you're not going to have any battles. Not with this God. Mm -mm. This is the God, the same God that sent his son, had him baptized and the Holy Spirit leads him straight to the devil. He doesn't lead him away from the fight. He brings him straight to Satan's doorstep. Why? Because God wants to let Satan know, here comes the blow. God wants to let you know that he's not pushing you away from battles. He's running you straight into the thing that Satan said would destroy you. Remember, Satan betted against Job, and God said, no, I know Job, and I'm going to let this happen. And Job persevered, and you have to persevere too. When you down there in that mud, when you over there and they putting uh, an IV in your arm, when the doctors are coming to check you over and over again, and they keep on taking blood to make sure things are going right, and they keep poking you and poking you and poking you. Anybody ever been there? Ooh, Sister Jerry. No, you feel me. One time they had poked me so much. I said, the next nurse coming here, I said, you ain't poking me. I'm going to say it. Because they messed up something. And one nurse, she was being mean. I'm like, man, I've been in this place for about five days. You ain't poking me no more. And the lady walked in, the next woman with the needle. She said, okay, Mr. Stalin, we got to do something special. Make sure everything good with your blood. I said, nope. No. Nah. It done got too hot in here. You're not poking me. <laughs> You're not poking me no more. I said, you see my arm? I'm all bruised up and messed up. You see me? I'm all swole up and you want to keep poking on me? I said, you ain't touching me. She said, Mr. Stalin. I said, God must have sent this woman. She said, Mr. Stalling, we have to do this. If we, if we don't do this, we don't know what's going on inside you. 
I said, okay, just do it. <laughs> I said, just do it. But I'm here now. And do you remember the time where that situation was supposed to take you down in past years, but you're here now? And God is saying, look, I'm still with you. I will be with you in the deep waters. The river shall not overflow you and the, the fire shall not burn nor scorch you. So what is the problem? It's me having my mind set on God. So God, what does God do? He wants to remind us, as he always do, of a few past victories. In verse 43, God reminds uh, his people of this. 43, Isaiah 43, verse 3, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave for your I gave Egypt for your ransom. Ethiopia and Seba in your place, since you were precious in myself. You remember Egypt? God says, you remember what happened in Egypt? Remember what I did in Egypt when they was persecuting you? Some people forgot that this was not a fairy tale. This was real life with a real live empire, with, with a real live pharaoh that thought he was, in his mind, the king of the world, that thought he was a god. And actually, not only thought he was a god, but thought the gods of Egypt were superior above all. And here comes this living God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of these shepherds. God says, you remember Egypt? Come with me to Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10. You remember Egypt? God brings up Egypt and Ethiopia. Remember that the Lord turned the water, the ten plagues, he turned water to blood. Then he turned, then he filled the whole land of Egypt with frogs. Then he sent gnats. Then he sent flies. Then he killed the livestock of Egypt. Then he put balls on their body. And then he sent hail on the land. In Exodus chapter 10, this is where he's sending the eight plague, locusts. God had humbled that nation. And he had not even, he's not even close to finishing. In Exodus 10, 4, or else if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. I'm going to eat up all your crops. I'm going to have them take all, all of it. And you know, Pharaoh, he still had that hard heart. And God wants his people to be reminded when the enemy tries to stand against him, he never wins. Situations may get hard, but keep on holding on. Satan never wins. It always backfires in his life. Satan himself knows he doesn't win. Look, even the movies he made, he know that the bad guy don't win. He know it himself. So they never actually, they, they caused some heaven for a look while, but ultimately, Thanos was defeated. Look at verse 7. Then Pharaoh's servants said about this situation, how long shall this man be a snare to us? Let the man go that they may serve the Lord their God. Watch what he says about all that is taking place. Do you not yet know that Egypt is destroyed? God said, I need you to remember that. I need you to remember times where you had great problems and God humbled your problems. Before the firstborn is even taken, these men are trying to convince Pharaoh to stop this. Don't you see that this place is destroyed? Don't you see how that, in other words, don't you see how their God has been fighting for them? You see what he's done to us? He, look, every time we go against these people, they come back stronger. Their God is fighting for them. And I got to have these victories in my mind. Since God fought for them, it's for my learning, Romans 15, 4, he's going to fight for me. And this won't get the victory over my life. He wants them to be reminded of those victories when he won, when the children of God won the battle. He wants you to remind yourself that, look, I'm still here despite all that I've been through. I'm still living. I'm still. I see Egypt didn't work. So I'm going to use Ethiopia. And I'm not just getting the empire. Say, say, I'm bringing one million men at your doorstep. 
And Satan really is threatening Asa to give up on this following your God and give up on living life for him and join his army. Only thing you got to do is walk away from God. That's joining Satan. But look at verse 11. And Asa cried out to the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing for you. Underline this. Lord, it is nothing for you to help whether with many or with those who have no power help us oh lord our god for notice this for we rest on you and in your name we go against this multitude oh lord you are our god do not let man prevail notice this do not let man prevail against you because if they defeat us lord they if they defeat us they defeat you See, that's, you gotta, that's how the ancient saw it. If I'm defeated, God is defeated. Faithful Christian, if you defeated, your God defeated. You connected with him, and they knew that. So he's, he's calling out to God. He says, Lord, don't let them prevail against you. In verse 12, so the Lord struck the Ethiopians before Asa and Judah, Judah and the Ethiopians fled. Look at verse 13. And Asa and the people who were with him pursued them to Gerar. So the Ethiopians were overthrown and they could not recover for they were broken. The situation didn't break. Asa. The situation didn't break. Judah. They were broken before the Lord and his army, and they carried away very much spoil. Talking about trusting God in the trenches. Asa was in the trenches. A million men at my doorstep. It's time for war, Asa. Asa said, yeah, it is time for war. And you know what I do in war? You want to know how I fight in war? Give me a second. You want to know why you can't defeat me in battle? One minute. Let me pray. You can't defeat me. You might as well stop trying, say. And you got to have that in your mind. You're not going to defeat me. This may hurt. I may cry. I may even bleed. I may lose a few nights of rest. But I tell you what, at the end, this situation won't break me. The Bible says they were broken before the Lord, not the children of God. The ones that came at the children of God, they were broken before the Lord and his army. So what I need to do, I need to stand with God and my situation will be broken. What came against me will be broken, but I won't be broken. I won't be defeated because the God that I serve, he loves to get down and fight and he refuses to be defeated. He refuses to take a loss to the devil. So how do we close this out? How does God close this out in Isaiah 43 verse 5 as he is talking to Christians that will be called from all generations, you know, speaking into the future, a prophet. So look at it like this. Look at it like this. You got to make it personal. You know, before you were even born, God already knew. He wasn't forcing it, but he knew who would obey the gospel. And he's already spoken to your situation. Before you were even born. Before your mama was born. Before you even thought about getting a word from God concerning your situation. Before 2024 ever even came, God has already spoken to your situation. God is already speaking to the future. And what does he say to his children that belong to him? That's been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Fear not. I am with you. I'm with you in 2024. 2025, 2026, until the Lord returns or you leave this world, God says you have no reason to fear. Why? He 
he said, for you are mine. I bought you with the blood. So when in 2024, when you come and encounter with your first situation, don't run. Face it. Say, this is going to be another victory. Whatever it may be, don't run from it. Take the challenge. A lot of y'all young folk took the ice challenge. Was out there dumping ice on one another. <laughs> Natalie said, no, it wasn't me. She said, no, I didn't take the challenge. <laughs> I didn't take the ice challenge. There were people like, you know, bracing themselves and coaches and everybody taking the challenge. Well, God said, take this challenge. When you face hard situations, when you deal with the water rising and the river trying to sweep you away and the fires trying to burn you, take this challenge. Trust in the Lord in the trenches. Trust the Lord in the battle. Trust the Lord in the fight and to fight with you in 2024. And maybe it is that you stand in need of prayer. We would love to pray for you. The Bible lets us know in 1 Peter 5, 7, that children of God casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. You don't have to bear the loads of life on your own. Cast them upon the Lord. We're going to pray for you and trust that the Lord will keep you and sustain you. Or maybe it is as a child of God, you've sinned. The Bible lets us know if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and look, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in the first John 1, 9 and 10. But maybe you're not a child of God this morning. God is calling you through his word. He wants to redeem you, buy you back, purchase you from sin and Satan. He wants you to be on his side, on the winning team with a God that will always love you and be there for you and escort you to heaven. As stated, turn to me.